very much, uh, Dr. Saad, for these nice words. And um, I'm going to start. Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome you tonight to one of our weekly online series. On behalf of the Educational Board of the Medical Association and the Education Society of Anesthesiology, I would like to welcome the speakers and attendees to this creative and prestigious continuous opportunity to deliver not only an up-to-date curriculum in the field of anesthesiology, critical care medicine and pain, but also to gather unique speakers and moderators from all over the globe. This opportunity is and will remain a great and successful experience in the current and the future virtual learning, especially during the current pandemic. Please let me introduce our first speaker today, Professor John Doyle. Uh, Dr. Doyle is with the Department of General Anesthesiology, Cleveland Clinic, as well uh, as a professor of anesthesiology at Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Doyle um, has received his MD degree in 1982 and his PhD degree in biomedical engineering in 1986, both from the University of Toronto. He received his Canadian board certification in anesthesia FRCPC in 1986 and his American certification in 1989. Dr. Doyle has a long-standing interest in ENT anesthesia and difficult airway management as well as an interest in the use of technology in medicine. His research has been supported by a number of funding agencies and he holds positions on a number of editorial boards. Dr. Doyle is past president of both the Society of Airway Management and Society for Technology in Anesthesia. He has received clinical teaching awards on uh, four occasions. Today, Dr. Doyle, uh, Dr. Doyle is going to speak to us about the history of airway management. Dr. Doyle, you may start. Thank you, Ahmed, for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone can see the screen here. Let me click on share. And if everything's all right, I will get started. So this is a companion presentation to deal with the presentation from two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we talked about the history of anesthesia. And today we're going to talk about the history of clinical airway management. And it's no surprise, of course, that these two are intertwined in important ways. But as you can see, airway management has changed uh, very much across the ages. We'll talk about some of the instrumentation shown on the left, but now we're often exposed to more advanced instrumentation of the airway, such as video laryngoscopy that we see commonplace and is shown on the right. I want to give due credit for one of the most valuable resources I used for this historical review. And this was from one of my colleagues, Dr. John Davidson, when I was at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, he published this article from Anesthesiology Clinics of North America, Intubation, What's Old, What's New, from uh, some 26 years ago. And it's a very nice historical account of the history of intubation. Indeed, you can see here from this illustration that there are many landmarks in the history of clinical airway management. In biblical times, we knew about death from airway obstruction, and this was recognized. This might be caused by strangulation, by abscesses, by leprosy, and we'll see a biblical explanation of this in a while. In the 1700s, we had metal and leather tubes inserted blindly into the trachea for the treatment of drowning or for other purposes. And then this became connected to anesthesia with Crawford Long discovering ether anesthesia, 1842. Garcia, a professor of singing, developed indirect laryngoscopy, and we'll cover that in a little while. And then we're going to talk, cover the history of diphtheria, where O'Dwyer popularized intubation for diphtheria, but also a comment on the antitoxins. And then Kirsten develops direct laryngoscopy. Kuhn developed flexometallic tracheal tubes. Chevalier Jackson developed an improved laryngoscope. In fact, he's one of the greatest laryngoscopists of all time. Griffiths introduced Carrari into clinical practice in the 1840s. And then in the 19, uh, 1950s, we had popularization of the use of tracheal tubes for general anesthesia, followed by the advent of advanced patient monitoring. And 
There were continuing improvements in laryngoscope and tube designs from the 1940s to the 1970s until we developed the now implant tested low rotation, low cuff pressure disposable tracheal tubes that are present to this day. 1980 saw the popularization of fiber optic intubation, the 1990s, the development of new laryngoscopes and in particular guidance for airway management, such as the ASA practice guidelines that uh, are now in its third or fourth generation, depending on which part of the literature you follow. The founding of the Society of Airway Management from 25 years ago is another important historical note. And this plus the Difficult Airway Society and other air societies have been producing guidance for clinical management. So this in one chart is a series of important landmarks for clinical airway management. But let's go back to the uh, Old Testament uh, where Elijah is shown here reviving the son of the widow. Here, this uh, son, let's get a look. Uh, uh, Elijah performed mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on a child who apparently had heat stroke. And this was the first example of assisted respiration. So the account goes, and he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child in the flesh of the child waxed warm. So this is believed to be the first description of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but there have been many other instances of biblical and religious accounts pertaining to airway management. St. Blaise served as the Bishop of Armenia in the fourth century. Little is known about his life, but legend tells us that he saved a small boy from choking on a fishbone, a problem that still occurs to this day. Because of this, his help is sought for those who are afflicted by illnesses of the throat. And on February 3, the Feast of St. Blaise, many Catholic churches offer the blessing of the throats as she shown here on the right. And you can see the two candles that are presented in formation for the throat. And here is an up close view of this for blessing the throat. Um, in the case of Homer, the famous author, uh, he described the death of Hector and he wrote that his spear went right through the fleshy part of the neck but did not sever his windpipe, so he could still speak. And Aristotle, in his book, Parts of the Animals, showed a sophisticated appreciation of the structure and function of the epiglottis, the vocal cords, and the trachea. Alexander the Great, um, one of the most famous uh, leaders of all time. Uh, Alberti, the uh, ENT doctor, recommended uh, uh, to understand that Alexander the Great opened up the trachea of a soldier given up for dead with the point of his dagger and established an airway in that way. This is an article, uh, Tracheostomy versus Intubation, a 19th century controversy. Balti also mentions that Hippocrates described and used an angled tube to relieve airway obstruction caused by quincy, which is basically superglottitis. He also condemned tracheostomies, citing threat to carotid arteries, as we know now, careful attention to the anatomy will eliminate this risk. In uh, the Middle East, Abyssinia, the Arab physician described airway management in his treatise, Liber Canonis, and he writes, when necessary, a cannula of gold, silver, or other suitable material is advanced down the throat to support inspiration. Another important player in the history of the airways is Blasius, he developed the first genuine anatomy text based on dissection of the human body. And this was very popular uh, based on the excellent woodcuts that were shown, such as those illustrated on the right. Uh, and the anatomy became much clearer for those people who wanted to do surgical airway management. As an example, here's an ancient uh, engraving illustrating a tracheostomy procedure uh, from this book from 1666. And you can see on the upper left, the patient who's struggling with uh, an obstructed airway, and you can see a vertical incision is made, it is opened up, uh, and then the appliance is introduced through a hole in the trachea, typically between the second and third tracheal rings for classical um, uh, tracheostomies, but for in the case of uh, cricothyroidomies through the cricothyroid membrane. Now here, it was not till 1788 that an indisputable reference to oral tracheal intubation in humans had occurred. Charles Kite, 
in his essay on the recovery of apparently dead, writes, the crooked tube bent like a male catheter should be introduced into the glottis through the mouth or one nostril. And this is 1788. And in a while, we'll show you what the catheter looked like. Here are some instruments for the recovery of the uh, apparently dead shown from that time. The elastic blowpipe uh, for the lungs is shown, the elastic tube of black leather containing medicines into the stomach, as well as other products. The idea is that you would be able to ventilate the lungs in this manner. This is the recommended curved metal catheter recommended by uh, Charles Kite that I uh, made mention of just a few slides ago. Here's an interesting story of inadvertent awake intubation. The Parisian surgeon Salt was responsible for demonstrating the ability of a conscious patient to tolerate an indwelling or a tracheal tube. He did this inadvertently, thinking that he had passed a tube into the esophagus for the purposes of providing nourishment, but a flickering of a lighted candle at the end of the tube demonstrated the tube's intratracheal position. Another description that we have is blind intubation for drowning. In their 1796 description of life measures for drowning patients, they advised placing a catheter blindly over the fingers placed posterior to the epiglottis, blind intubation, using your fingers as a guide. Now, one of the most interesting diseases that has had an impact on airway management is diphtheria. It's an upper airway tract illness characterized by sore throat, low-grade fever, and a pseudomembrane, an inherent membrane on the tonsils. And this membrane can obstruct the airway. So it's caused by Cornybacterium diphtheriae and aerobic gram-positive bacterium shown on the right. So a pseudomembrane is formed at the back, um, typically of a child. The membrane can grow and extend further down the throat, suffocating the victim. In the, 19, uh, in the 1890s, the German physician Emil von uh, Bering developed an antitoxin that, although it did not kill the bacteria, it neutralized the toxic poisons that the bacteria released into the body. For this discovery and his development of the serum therapy for diphtheria, he won the first ever Nobel Prize in 1901. So the treatment uh, was an antitoxin, but there still was a problem with that adherent membrane that could cause suffocation. In February 1925, a deadly diphtheria epidemic was poised to sweep through Nome, Alaska, in the northern part of the U.S., the only serum that could stop the outbreak was in Anchorage, Alaska, 700 miles away. The only aircraft that could deliver the medicine was taken out of winter storage, but its engine was frozen, could not start. So after considering all the alternatives, officials decided to move the medicine along using a series of sled dogs for the whole 700 mile journey. And this lead dog, his name is Balto, is uh, commemorated here in Central Park in New York because this uh, lead dog led the team for the 700 mile journey to provide the antitoxin to Nome, Alaska. Later on in late 1928, an outbreak of diphtheria occurred in Northern Alberta, Canada. And in January, 1929, two individuals headed to Edmonton in the Avro av uh, avian uh, aircraft shown here with the necessary diphtheria antitoxin. Their flight path took them first to McClung, where they spent the night, and then on to Peace River for refueling. They headed north uh, to Fort Vermilion, and despite dangerously frigid weather and engine problems, the two pilots arrived safely with the antitoxin and returned three days later to a cheering crowd of 10,000 people. So this was the antitoxin delivered. This is an open cockpit aircraft, maximum speed 102 miles an hour, cruise speed 87 miles an hour. And the key thing is that it had limited range, only 400 miles. And the problem was keeping warm in these Canadian winter conditions. So one of the first early effective treatments was discovered in the 1880s by Joseph O'Dwyer, who I'd like to tell you more about. He developed tubes that could be inserted into the throat of diphtheria victims uh, or other victims um, and the idea was that you could establish an airway in this way. And it was a blind instrument shown here where you try to insert this device into the glottic aperture to keep it open. And so 
Here we see an illustration of how it is done. The device was introduced blindly into the glottic aperture uh, with some wires coming out or strings coming out that allow you to remove it later. But you can see one of the challenges here is that the victim could bite on the finger of the caregiver, uh, causing them to get diphtheria as well. Uh, so here are some of the instruments that were used, a gag, an introducer, and other things, as well as a device for extracting this airway device. Uh, here is a figure from the book Intubation of the Larynx, showing the proper position for a patient for successful intubation. So the child who is obstructing their airway would be seated in the lap of mother, and then one would try and intubate the trachea posteriorly. And this would be an alternative to a tracheostomy. Here is a device that went over your finger so that when you try to insert this device, when the child bit down on you, you would be protected by this, by this product and prevent you from getting diphtheria yourself. Other developments in intubation occurred and Trendelenburg, uh, the famous German surgeon responsible for the Trendelenburg position and many other innovations, he adapted to human use, a method of delivering chloroform via tracheostomy tube, allowing them to pack off the pharynx and prevent the aspiration of blood during oral and nasal procedures. Another development was McEwen, a Glasgow surgeon. He was the first to administer endotracheal anesthesia. His first case involved resection of a massive oral tumor following awake intubation without local anesthesia. This cocaine had not entered into clinical practice until 1884, some six years later. McEwen's second and third cases involved intubation for laryngeal edema following aspiration of pieces of hot potato. In the second oral tumor case, the patient could not tolerate the endotracheal tube after placement. Remember, this was done without local anesthesia and begged to get chloroform prior to another attempt. McEwen acceded to the patient's request, gave chloroform, but the patient died on induction of anesthesia from an unrestricted airway. Here is a sample of the McEwen tube and he used both gum elastic and flexo-metallic type tubes inserted into the glottic aperture. Another innovator from Germany, influenced by the works of McEwen and O'Dwyer, Franz Kuhn, uh, 1902, invented an endotracheal tube that was flexible, easy to insert and resist the tinking. And a fitted stylet made for the tube, uh, made for uh, blind insertion. An earpiece attachment even allowed for the auscultation of breath sounds. And you can see the earpiece right there. So you could do auscultation and that would help Ian monitor the patient. Here is the device. You can see it's a flexo-metallic device put in with an introducer, but also shown there is a means to deliver your anesthetic agent into the dome. Here is the intubation kit with a preformed metal stylet. Uh, comes from the collection of instruments from uh, Vienna, uh, Austria. Another technique that was in commonplace was insufflation in the years leading up to World War I. Considerable interest in anesthesia by ether insufflation had developed using this kind of insufflation catheter. In the early 1920s, McGill reintroduced the concept of a large caliber tube allowing bidirectional gas flow instead of using the narrow bore insufflation catheter. And McGill also invented McGill forceps and popularized blind nasal intubation. Here is a McGill intratracheal uh, catheter showing both e uh, insufflation and egress ports. So this would go inside the trachea. And then a big development occurred with improvements in laryngoscopy and that changed the landscape in important ways. And so let's take a look at the history of laryngoscopy. It all begins with a nun clinician, Manuel Garcia, a professor of singing at the Paris Conservatory used a system of mirrors to vocalize its own vocal cords during phonation. This was 1854, and again, before the advent of local anesthesia. So he was interested in the mechanics of phonation, and he developed an instrument that allowed one to see the larynx. So he began with indirect laryngoscopy. You can see the mirror here, uh, the tongue being pulled out, and then with the uh, appropriate use of lighting, you can see what's going on through the mirror. Later on, new developments with indirect laryngoscopy occurred 
with, for example, this bivalved laryngeal speculum with a mirror built in, another way of seeing what's going on. But in due course, direct laryngoscopy became more popular and more valuable. Here is Christine's autoscope showing two blades. You can attach which either blade you want. This brings us to 1897. And you can see here uh, how was how the procedure was carried out. By this time, uh, topical anesthesia using cocaine was available and make the whole process somewhat easier. Here's Kirstein's book, Autoscopy of the Larynx and the Trachea, subtitled Direct Examination Without a Mirror. And this book from 1897 is available for anyone who wants to download it from Google Books. If you're interested in the history of, uh, of airway management, uh, this nice uh, book available from Google Books comes with a signature from the author himself. Here's an interesting thing that was uh, pertinent at the times, an instrument for passing a ligature through the epiglottis to lift it out of the way. So uh, we now put in an indirect, um, we now put in uh, our direct laryngoscope into the molecula uh, to advance the epiglottis out of the way, but here you could actually put in a ligature and lift it out of the way for some forms of clinical airway management. Another form of laryngoscope was developed by Chevalier Jackson, one of the greatest, if not the greatest laryngologists of all time. And he developed so many different kinds of laryngoscopy. Here is suspension laryngoscopy that uh, he popularized. And this is the view obtained with suspension laryngoscopy. And he published a book called Bronchoscopy and Esophagoscopy. In fact, a variety of books uh, here. This brings us to 1922. So we are more or less exactly 100 years away now. So his books, also available free uh, download from Google, uh, have a lot of suggestions that are true even to this day. Following laryngoscopy and the development of the Macintosh and Miller laryngoscopes that we're familiar with in the 1940s, another important development was various kinds of superglottic airways, such as the laryngeal mask airway. And this is perhaps the, the last in the series of important developments for uh, airway management, that and the development of video laryngoscopy. So the LMA, as we know, uh, is designed to provide an oval seal around the laryngeal inlet. Once the LMA is inserted and the cuff inflated, when inserted, it lies at the crossroads of the digestive and respiratory tract. So here's a nice illustration of that. Uh, this was a technique developed by Archie Brain. And on the right, you can see a variety of variants that uh, have been developed over time, in addition to his original reusable classic product and single use products, he developed a variety of uh, superglottic airways intended for various kinds of uses, such as, for example, on the right, that one could intubate through. One interesting technology related to superglottic airways that we no longer have available, the LMA C track allowed you to see the glottic aperture when you placed it and even allowed you to pass tubes through that orifice into the, uh, uh, into the glottic aperture under direct vision. But this is a product no longer commonly available. Here are some of the variety of uh, LMA prototypes uh, that Archie Brain worked on. He made a great number of these various prototypes and worked with uh, various kinds of um, radiographic imaging, as well as with cadavers, to try and get his initial design just right. So there was a lot of work that went into the development of his product. And so uh, in the 1980s, Archie uh, Brain was able to patent uh, the uh, artificial airway device known as the laryngeal mask airway, or laryngeal mask. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that uh, he filed it in 1982, it was uh, uh, provided in 1985. This is a US patent, but he also patented other countries. But on the bottom here, you can see a reference to a document called Leech. Uh, here is the, the description of his superglottic airway, his laryngeal mask, uh, and go back to the document of Leech. What is this Leech document? Well, if you go back, he invented a thing from, um, uh, 1936, called the pharyngeal bulb airway, and it was in many respects the very first superglottic airway 
and it did not really pass the test of time. It got reinvented as the superglottic airway that, uh, that Archie Brain invented. And here it is in description. You can see the pharyngeal bulb, uh, bulb airway shown here fits um, in a superglottic manner, but it didn't have a cuff as such that was inflatable, um, but it was used uh, for a number of years before it faded away from the clinical world. Uh, but here it is described in 1937 in anesthesia and analgesia, the pharyngeal bulb uh, gas airway, a new aid to cyclopropane anesthesia. So this was sometimes used with cyclopropane anesthesia. Uh, and as you know, cyclopropane um, has the disadvantage that it's highly explosive, meaning that if you use cautery, you can get an explosion. Um, and so, uh, Cyclopropane eventually faded away as uh, halophane became available. And here is an x-ray uh, showing the, uh, the uh, gas, uh, pharyngeal bulb gas way in place, just to showing how sometimes important historical developments are based on others. Uh, there's been many more recent important developments in clinical airway management that, because they are more recent, are not really history, but will form the basis for historical discussions in the future. We have fiber optic intubation, which uh, became popular in the late 70s and early 80s, and then popularized even more as we got more ex uh, experience in difficult airways and awake intubation. Video laryngoscopes, such as the uh, McGrath, as well as um, other video laryngoscopes such as uh, around the world have changed the landscape in important ways and the development of airway algorithms. Another important development, the ASA difficult airway algorithm first described in 1993, republished in 2003, republished again in 2013, and we are waiting for the fourth edition of that airway algorithm to come out. Meanwhile, airway algorithms have come out from the UK, from Canada, from China, uh, and many other countries that reflect the resources available in those various nations. So that brings to an end our discussion of the history of clinical airway management. I want to thank you for time, your time, and I will stay uh, online uh, for subsequent questions um, at the end of this session or at the end of a, uh, uh, at, at the end of the whole session. Uh, thank you very much again. So um, nothing in the box here, but I have a question uh, for Prof. Doyle. Is there any superiority uh, of any of the video laryngoscope devices over the other? Um, that's a difficult question because it will depend to some extent on practical things like uh, cost. Uh, for example, my favorite video laryngoscope is the, uh, the new GlideScope that's come out. Uh, but it's rather expensive compared to some of the uh, simpler portable ones. Uh, the McGrath video laryngoscope is the one that's our go-to video laryngoscope because it's nice and compact. We can open the drawer and pull it out. Uh, the primary advantage of it is it's portable and it's easy to use and you can use it for ordinary laryngoscopy for training. Uh, it doesn't have a hyperangulated blade and some people prefer a hyperangulated blade for a very anterior larynx. And in that setting, you might find that uh, video laryngoscopes such as the GlideScope, depending on which kind of blade you use, might be appropriate. Uh, in addition, a number of other manufacturers can offer you various kinds of, of, of blades that you can select, uh, stores, for example. So it's hard to know in any serious scientific way which is the best one. There are a number of products available, and you have enthusiasts for all of them. And some of them are more suitable for special circumstances, uh, for example, anterior larynx, than, for example, for routine use. Um, I have another uh, question here. So, uh, when are we going to have a 3D video uh, laryngoscope? Um, so, the question what about a 3D video laryngoscope? Um, the manufacturers would ask number one, is there a need? Uh, and how much extra use can you get uh, compared to ordinary video laryngoscopy? Um, it would be nice if you had a video laryngoscope that was in some way linked to a CT scan for difficult airways. 
Uh, these are all things that people are wondering about for future technologies. But it's not clear to us that a 3D technology uh, is needed in most cases. For, for some people, their approach is if it's a difficult airway, let me review the CTs and the nasopharyngoscope examinations, and then I'm just going to do it awake fiber optically. For many people, it's just awake fiber optic. And if that doesn't work and it's really a difficult airway because of tumor, then we'll do a tracheostomy on your local. So many people, in the really complex cases, just those two options. Yeah. And another uh, question we related to that. So uh, when are we going to have a robotic airway management device for clinical use? When are we gonna have a robotic airway device for clinical use? Uh, uh, robotic intubation has been described. It's in the literature. Uh, a study came out showing its use uh, in a mannequin uh, out of McGill University. And uh, you can imagine that might be of interest, but there are some people, some of my clinician friends who simply say that's all well and good, but what we need to concentrate is uh, on better clinical decision-making uh, for the people who are faced with difficult airways. Uh, artificial intelligence might be best focused on it advising about approach to airway management instead of doing it robotically. Other people are saying, if you have the CT scan, and you have electronic navigation, you should be able to develop artificial intelligence that will automatically advance the tube into the right position based on the CT scan. So there's people thinking about that, but this is all next generation or, or future stuff. Okay. Um, another question, uh, how to overcome the problems of hyperacute angled bladed videoscope? Uh, so one of the problems with an, a hyperacute angle is that when you pass the endotracheal tube, it hits the anterior tracheal wall and wouldn't budge from there. That's the, perhaps the most common example. And there are some special techniques that can be used and they're described in the literature. Um, an example of that is when my tube hits the anterior tracheal wall because I'm having a hyperangulated blade, I will pull back the stylet by five centimeters and that softens the tip and allows it to advance. Uh, and then sometimes we'll, um, take out the stylet completely and then rotate the tube 300, uh, I should say 180 degrees. So it, a tip goes from an anterior position to a posterior position. These are all examples of tricks that are described. Uh, in one of our articles, we described a dozen of these tricks uh, that can be useful for anyone who likes the glide scope and it's hyperangulated blade. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a, the last question. Uh, do you think using classic direct laryngoscopes or only video laryngoscopes is more educational for the trainees? So that's a debate that will never end. So some of my colleagues say, start off with direct laryngoscopy and then switch over to video laryngoscopy. And I teach the exact opposite. I teach that we should start off our medical students with video laryngoscopy so that they are intimately familiar with the structures, it gets them to easier to see what's going on. And then I will introduce direct laryngoscopy later because direct laryngoscopy requires uh, more skill than video laryngoscopy. And if they do not get a good view of the epiglottis, at least they'll be able to recognize the epiglottis uh, with direct laryngoscopy, having familiarized them uh, with it by video laryngoscopy. So two big camps and they can't agree with each other. And there's some people want to get rid of direct laryngoscopy completely. They think it's a waste of time. We've got video laryngoscopy. It's so much better. We can get rid of direct laryngoscopy, they would argue, uh, just like we can get rid of uh, uh, um, abacuses to do our arithmetic. Thank you. Um, that was nicely illustrated, uh, the Prof. Doyle. Uh, thank you very much.